are in trouble, but society only seems to want to make money off of them in Lost Angels, one of five new movies we're going to be reviewing this week. I'm Siskel and Ebert, and I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Our first film, Lost Angels, is one of those rare teenage films with intelligence and visual style. And it also features a breakthrough performance by a very talented young actor making his feature film debut. Newcomer Adam Horovitz, a member of the rock group The Beastie Boys, plays an angry young man whose mother sends him against his will to a psychiatric hospital. Mom's still out there, isn't she? Isn't my mother out there? My mom's still out there, isn't she? James? Tim rebels against the hospital rules, and soon his estranged parents are brought together by psychiatrist Donald Sutherland for a hospital conference. Why don't you just cut all this crap and tell us how we can get him out of here? Thank you, Richard. Thank you for your profound insight into adolescent psychology. He should have stayed with me, Felicia. Like Andy? Oh, yes, you're doing a wonderful job with him. Maybe you could even teach Tim how to break into houses with a crowbar. Tim escapes from the hospital for a joyride with his wild friends, but he has second thoughts and pays a surprise visit to Sutherland's home. What do you want? You want to hang out with your badass friends? You want to live with me? You want to hit the road? You want to party? What do you want? Do you know? You do know, don't you? They're very good together. Lost Angels does a very good job of enlivening familiar movie scenes, teenage rebellion against parents, gang fights, Nervous young love and a psychiatrist trying to make contact with an adolescent. Credit for the freshness of Lost Angels must go to director Hugh Hudson, who made the Oscar-winning Chariots of Fire. The scenes here have a special glow, a special visual glow, and young Adam Horovitz proves a possible successor to James Dean or the person he most resembles, a young Warren Beatty. He's eminently watchable, as is most everything about Lost Angels. I had a lot of regard for the movie, Gene, and a lot of respect for the performance. There's also Donald Sutherland, who really has a yeah. pivotal performance. I think in this he's movie. very good, yeah. And yet I can't recommend it, and wow. I'll tell you why. Two reasons. First of all, I think the entire subplot involving the stepbrother and the attempt to drive through the ghetto and shoot at people and whether or not the kid would go along with that or not was lurid, melodramatic, violent, and unnecessary and broke the fabric of what the film was really about. And the second thing that bothered me was there's a, such a, a strange, cool detachment about this film that even while I was sitting there admiring the performances and admiring basically the ideas of the film, including all of this anger about how these kids are treated by these institutions, I still wasn't feeling very strongly uh, any emotions about it. It didn't seem well, to engage me. Number one, you're dealing with uh, people who are cut off. I mean, mm -hmm. these kids feel absolutely separate, uh, apart from the world. They, they can't relate to adults. I'm not they asking can't even for them to, to feel. I'm asking for me to feel. Well, that's, it may be your problem, because I certainly felt for their situations. Mm -hmm. As far as the joyride into uh, the gang fight and all that, uh, it's, it's far-fetched, it's, yeah, but it's, it's, it's far-fetched. But I think it's, it's absolutely riveting the way it's shot and all that. And I, and I, I, I well, took it doesn't it, belong in another film, though. Does it really have anything know. to do with this film? Wouldn't this film have been a better film if they had left out all, you know what, uh, all of that really no. improbable stuff? No, but you know what it taught me about? First of all, I, I, I wasn't aware of that behavior. Here are a bunch of white uh, Anglo-Saxon kids, basically, who are, try who are so disconnected from themselves, their parents, and everybody else, that they're trying to act like... Uh, Latino kids. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was a fascinating thing. If it does go on, it's interesting. If it doesn't go on, it's still interesting. You because shouldn't it's... have to ask that question after seeing the movie. What? Whether it goes on or not. I'm saying I enjoyed it for what it was. You have idea whether it was real or whether they just made it up in order to... I enjoyed it either way. Okay. Either way, I enjoyed it. And okay. It, this kid, you didn't think that was a real yes, breakthrough performance? Yes, it was a good performance. I said it was a good performance. Okay. I said I, it was a good performance. I wouldn't want to miss this movie. Okay, I'm glad you didn't. Next movie, and our next movie is one that you didn't miss either. 
and neither did I, but I don't know whether you wanted to miss it or not. It's called The Return of Swamp Thing. It's a sequel to the 1982 movie that somewhat to our surprise, Gene and I both actually enjoyed very much. This movie, Return of Swamp Thing, is not quite the equal of the original, but it continues more or less in the same spirit as a mad scientist uh, film in which we feel only sympathy for Swamp Thing. As you may or may not remember, Swamp Thing was once a respected scientist until he was burned in a laboratory explosion and covered with a mysterious substance, and when he jumped into the swamp to quench the flames, the chemicals interacted with the swamp water to make him into the first vegetable superhero. I'm a plant. That's okay. I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> That's Heather Locklear as the stepdaughter of mad scientist Louis Jordan, who believes he knows the secret of eternal life. You're mad! I never felt saner. Take good care of my stepdaughter, please. Swamp Thing is the good guy in this movie, but there are other monsters out there in that polluted water who only want to maim and kill. The thing I like best about Return of Swamp Thing is the reasonable, reserved, and civilized behavior by Swamp Thing himself. As played by Dick Durock, he truly seems to come from the valley of the gentle green giants, and he speaks softly like an out-of-town businessman who had just come along in time to prevent Heather Locklear from being mugged right there in the swamp. I personally thought that Louis Jordan should have turned up the voltage on his mad scientist performance. I don't think there's any advantage to being subtle in these roles. But by and large, I enjoyed myself, and it was good to see Swamp Thing back in the water again. And I know that what you're thinking is, I know I can read your mind, how can I possibly give a good review to Return of Swamp Thing and give thumbs down to Lost Angels? Is that what you're asking? You got would it. Would you like me to answer that, or would you... I'll keep going. You're I'd doing be, fine. I'd be happy Just to try do. and jump between okay. the seats while you carry on. Swamp Thing is successful at being... The Return of Swamp Thing is successful at being Return of Swamp Thing. It, I mean, when you go to see a movie like this, you have a set of expectations, Gene. You can't tell me you didn't. Yeah. But, I hope that would, yes. my expectation was... I saw funny, what... I thought I was going to talk. I saw... No, no, you asked me to talk, and I said I'd be happy to. Yeah. I expected to see more or less what I saw at Return of Swamp Thing, and I thought they did a pretty good job of it. Yeah. I, like I felt that on its much higher level of ambition and achievement, Lost Angels didn't quite make it over the, over the edge. And so, in other words, if you had to see one of the two films again, you'd rather go see Swamp Thing, right? Return to Swamp Thing? I'm not sure. I'm really not sure about that. Well, I think you, you should see the I, could, I think again. I could easily see a film twice that I still couldn't recommend and still be interested in seeing it the second one? time for the good qualities in it. And would that be one of them? Lost Angels? Yes. Okay. Yes, it would be. Yes. Now, as far as Return of Swamp Thing is concerned, I had one expectation that it would be as good or possibly better than Swamp Thing. Return of Swamp Thing. It wasn't. I sat there, Swamp Thing, the I, I like Swampy. Didn't I liked him the first time. Yeah. He was sympathetic. He was a you know, poor guy stuck in the, a bunch of vegetation. This time, I thought he was just a guy walking around, and Louis Jordan looked like a stiff. He looked, I thought about his health when well, I watched he, he him. Was, you're supposed to. After all, this man only has 24 hours to live unless he can get this injection of new genes, well, you know. I mean, no, but he That's looked, the whole plot. I you know, know that. You realize that. Yes. So didn't you like his, sci his mad scientist no, I, laboratory? No, I didn't like him any more than you liked him. You knocked him in the film. I didn't like the swamp thing. I didn't like uh, George Ann. You didn't? And, and then Heather Locklear just walked around right. with a few clothes we on. We have a disagreement then. No Two kidding. Okay, thank you. Coming up next, Getting It Right, a rites of passage story about a 31-year-old man trying to find the right girl. Here I am. Our next one is called Getting It Right, the most pleasing story of a 31-year-old London hairdresser named Gavin who finds it terribly difficult to relate to women his own age. His luck begins to change, however, when he attends a wild party hosted by the wealthy and very frank Lynn Redgrave. Alone together, they play a game called Secrets. I'm 45 years old. I'm so terrified of the dark that I don't even go to bed with someone I love with the lights out. When I first saw you, I thought you were a homosexual. better to play fast. I'm 31 and I've never been to bed with anybody. At the party, Gavin meets a wild young woman named Minerva who gets drunk and wants to sleep over at Gavin's flat. But he still lives with his conservative parents. What I'm trying to say is I can't have you stay. It's not my house, you see. I'm sure your parents wouldn't mind, not for one night. They would. But to then you are absolutely destitute. They'd still mind. But you promised. I'm That's Helena Bonham Carter from A Room with a View. Eventually, working-class Gavin gets to meet her wealthy father, John Gilgood, who mistakenly thinks Gavin is a shrewd gold digger. I'll tell you what, I'll make you a proposition. 
If you marry my daughter, I'll find you a real job with prospects. That's very kind of you, but I'm afraid it, it won't be any good. You see, I just... I was going to give you a lump sum to put down on a flat. But I'll tell you what, I'll make it a house. No, really, I... You're shrewder than you look. We'll make a businessman of you yet. I'll make you a director of one of my smaller subsidiary companies. It's got nothing to do with what you do for me. I, I just don't want to marry her. You see, I really don't love her. I'll throw in an apartment on the Riviera. My word, you're a sharp operator. I'll guarantee your visa card up to 500 a month. I'll buy you a Porsche. And the bidding continues there for him. Getting It Right is full of fresh characters and surprising situation. It was directed by Randall Kleiser, who previously made Grease and The Blue Lagoon. This is much more offbeat material, but the result is even more pleasing. Gavin Lamb, as played by Jesse Birdsall, is an original character, even though his problems are quite familiar. Getting It Right is based on the script and novel by Elizabeth Jane Howard, and it proves that a little good writing goes a long way in making a good movie. And just like Lost Angels, the material here is very familiar, but the way it's written makes it special. I loved this movie, and one of the things I liked about it was the way that it refers to a whole tradition of British movies like Billy Liar and Darling and other movies where people, where the hero moves through the various strata of British society and still maintains his own identity, even though it's kind of a close call from time to time. This movie is filled with original characters. Mm -hmm. It's filled with very, very, very intelligent dialogue that you can listen to and learn from and enjoy in terms of the interplay of wit and meaning and subtlety and what's really being said. And uh, the performance, the performance by Jesse Birdsell is, is right up there with, with, with performances like Dustin Hoffman in The Graduate. I mean, a totally original young man who goes his own way despite the fact that everything in his life is trying to push him into different directions. Well, you know, to me, I, I see a picture like this. It seems so simple. Mm -hmm. The person speaks directly with intelligence that approximates the sort of real world. And mm -hmm. I think, I, I can't understand why more films can't be this way. That's, that, that's the printout that I have. When I watch this picture, I think, you know, it's, it's terrific. Mm -hmm. But why can't more people write this way? It seems so easy when it's written the like this. The hardest, I think, the hardest kind of movie to make is a movie in which the people are at least as intelligent I know. as the ordinary person watching the movie. Yeah. Most movie characters are not that smart. And even though people try to write them, it just can't be done. In this movie, you really feel as if you're looking at, at ordinary Fascinating, interesting, offbeat, eccentric people, but ordinary people leading their lives. Uh, coming up next, Listen to Me, a movie about a college debating team that makes a comeback before the United States Supreme Court. If he gives you so much as one piece of documented evidence, I'll eat my shoe. Our next movie is named Listen to Me, and this is without any doubt one of the strangest, weirdest, most inexplicable movies of this or any year. It's about a college debating team that during one action-packed season learns how to accept life, death, love, and tragedy, and how to overcome its handicaps. This is kind of a rocky movie using words instead of gloves. But if I made it sound too intellectual, don't worry. This is the first movie to promote debating as a neat way to pick up girls. A debate, as practiced here, is rougher than football. Yeah. Meaner than ice hockey. Yeah. Yeah. Much more strenuous than wrestling. Yeah. And because women can play at it, just as down and dirty as the men, it's probably the scariest, most fascinating sport on the face of the planet. That's Roy Scheider as a debate coach, kind of the coach Woody Hayes of debating. He's tough, but he's good, and under his coaching, two freshmen make it all the way to the national finals. Give him your best rhetoric. If we can't win this thing on facts, then we damn well better win it on drama. Kurt Cameron and Jamie Gertz play the star debaters, and earlier in the film, a senator's son, played by Tom Quill, seems to have a death wish because he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth and can talk around it. Hey, how fast we going? 80! At 95, the turbos will cut in his late rubber! Don't you dare! This is the kind of movie where they introduce a couple of completely unnecessary characters as an excuse for a soap opera like this. May I have this dance? Don't you ever hear anything I say to you? I can't do this. I can't dance. Bruce, what are you doing? I love you. 
Listen to me would like to be one of the most shamelessly manipulative movies of the year, but it's not good enough to be manipulative, and almost every line of dialogue sounds completely false. The worst dialogue occurs in the most crucial scene when the debaters are up against a Harvard team and arguing about abortion in front of the five Supreme Court justices, or five of the Supreme Court justices. To give you an idea how bad their arguments are, the movie hardly even allows the Harvard team to even get a word in edgewise, and yet I still felt the Harvard team should have won. If you listen carefully to the big speech by the young woman, played by Jamie Gertz, you realize at the end of it that she is hopelessly confused and has no idea at all whether she favors abortion or not. Well, this movie is kind of astounding. Uh, first of all, debate doesn't lend itself to being uh, an action sport in the movies. Uh, so there are all kinds of funny things going on in your reaction that way. Um, the other thing is, I didn't think they were particularly good debaters. No. And this is, these are supposed to be the, the nation's best. Uh, so even at that level, just taking it as a, a realistic uh, enterprise, which is hard, uh, I don't think it works at all. Then there's the question of all of the way it, it jam-packs all kinds of teenage problems uh, into this picture, and we have a crippled person and all that. It's noble. I mean, the film's goal is noble. It wants these kids to be happy and uh, all that. But, gee, the, it, it's so corny. This it's, is it's, the kind of movie where they say, why don't they make more movies like this? And then when you see it, you realize why. It's one of those yeah. other side of the mountain kinds of things. It's so noble, and it has such a bleeding The funniest heart. thing for me, and I must uh, confess that I broke down and laughed her a couple of times, is when they try to pack debating as a sport into a format right. like bicycle racing, boxing, or any of those other come from behind, uh, you know, and the, the guy's down on the, on the ropes, and then right. finally he gets up, and, and the, it's the same thing with the debate here. They're defeated, and then she comes back, and maybe she can win in the last round, and you're just sitting there uh, almost bemused by the conflict of genres here. It's just that this material doesn't fit into this form. No. Coming up next, a strange story of a woman who reads books to people and gets very much involved with her listeners. Our next film is called La Lectrice. That's French for the reader, and it's a most original story within a story about a woman who reads books to an assortment of people who can't or won't read for themselves. She winds up triggering their fantasies in a film that is a beguiling tribute to the power of words and a human speech. It's also a lot of fun. The French actress Miu Miu plays the reader, and here she auditions to read for a Hungarian general's nostalgic widow. De l'ambassade, et je brillais. Et lui, si elle va d'abord vers sa cousine, elle sera ma femme. Tu as lu Guerre et un bon point. She also reads Alice in Wonderland to a six-year-old girl who feels abandoned by her busy mother. Alice bondit, car elle venait de comprendre. Dans un nouvel club, qu'elle n'avait encore jamais vu un lapin tirer une montre de son gilet. Et où sortez La prochaine fois La prochaine fois, c'est maintenant. Dis oui, Marie. Je dis oui. Imprudente. Une fois de plus. Other people that she reads to include a retired judge who wants to have the works of the Marquis de Sade read to him, a successful but insecure businessman who also needs some sexual comforting, and a paralyzed teenage boy who requests the passionate poetry of Baudelaire. La Lectrice uses words as they have rarely been used in the movie. Language, the sound of words, the shape of words, becomes an actual character of its own, the most important character in the film, dominating everything, including the woman who is reading. The result is a most original film celebrating the written and spoken word. I agree with everything you've said, and I would talk about another aspect of the film. I think you're absolutely right about the words in this film. The voluptuousness of mm -hmm. these words, mm -hmm. the beauty of these words, and the fact that they're in French and subtitled in English, in an odd way, puts a spin on it that makes them even more otherworldly and so even more mysterious. Yeah, I've never heard language used this way in a picture. But what is also fascinating about the film is the way she develops a relationship with each of these people mm -hmm. she's reading to through the words that she's reading. And she has, without giving away too much of the film, she has an affair, mm -hmm. she has a flirtation that seems to be leading somewhere. She has anguish, she has tragedy. It seems like each person wants her to read to them exactly what they need to complete their lives, and by reading it to them, she completes their lives for them so that she becomes part of a, of a bond with each per other person in this movie. Psychologically, it's fascinating. It's a very special film, and again, this is a picture that uses language. We've been talking, all of the films that I, yeah. we really like on this show, it's the written word and spoken word that really distinguish them. It's quite uh, unusual this week. 
That's right. Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed on this show. We had a major disagreement on Lost Angels, the story of a teenager trapped in the youth rehabilitation system. Gene admired it immensely. My emotions were not so engaged. Another disagreement on the return of Swamp Thing. I felt the movie reached its admittedly limited goals, but Gene wanted more meat with his vegetable. Two thumbs up for getting it right. The dazzling, witty, sharp-edged story of an uncertain young man coming of age in London. We didn't have much of a debate about Listen to Me, the movie that tried to make debating into a contact sport. Two thumbs down. But finally, we were both enthusiastic about La Lectrice, in which a woman gets inside the minds of her clients by reading them their fantasies. And so for me, La Lectrice and Getting It Right, two very good, very smart movies. And I hope that you'll go see Lost Angels again, which you said you might do, because I think if you see it, I think you're going to see a very fine performance by this Adam Horowitz, and I think a picture with great deal of style. And we've talked often about how there is little style in movies today. This film has great style. That's it for this week. Next time, we'll be back with reviews of five new movies, including Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder in the comedy See No Evil, Hear No Evil. And Gina Davis and Jeff Goldblum star in the music-filled comedy called Earth Girls Are Easy. That's next week. And until then, the balcony is closed. Raisinets and Goobers are playing everywhere, starring plump, juicy raisins and great golden peanuts. Both now feature creamy Nestle milk chocolate. Backed by popular demand, your favorite old-time chewing gum, Beeman's Blackjack and Clove, a truly different taste experience. Beeman's Blackjack and Clove, available for a limited time only. After work or after workout, Daisy Turbo Spa combines powerful water massage and tingling aeration to turn your tub into a personal whirlpool. Pledge, with Pledge, dusting can be beautiful. Now available in spring fresh scent.